Welcome to Crash Course, a podcast about business, political, and social disruption, and what we can learn from it. I'm Tim O'Brien. Today's Crash Course, Chip Wars, and the most important company you've never heard of. Big global collisions are always about power and often about money. Politics, religion, nationalism, and egos play their parts, of course, but money and how money gets made goes a long way toward explaining things. Once upon a time, trade, wealth, and power centered around things like silk, silver, gold, spices, sugar, tea, tobacco, cotton, and the like. After that, the Industrial Revolution was built on the back of coal, steel, and, of course, oil. And in our era, the era of technological revolutions built on bits and bytes, semiconductors, or chips, are the coin of the realm. Semiconductors are tiny silicon wafers crisscrossed by millions, sometimes billions, of microscopic transistors that store and process digitized information. They allow for massive, accessible, and ubiquitous computing, and they are such stuff as dreams are made on. They're pivotal components of the burgeoning artificial intelligence industry, and they now power everything from cars and appliances to missile defense systems and nuclear weaponry. Chips are so central to the consumer world, the shape of economies, and national security that they also inform geopolitical maneuvering and the headbutting between China and the U.S. for global dominance. Who else would you bring on to talk about the meaning of this sprawling, fascinating, and complex collision other than the author of a book titled, appropriately, Chip Wars, The Fight for the World's Most Crucial Technology? In addition to writing an illuminating book, Chris Miller is also a historian at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University, and he joins us here today. Welcome, Chris. Thank you for having me. So talk to us a little bit as we start things off, Chris, about how you wound up being such an interesting geek (laughs) and so fascinated by the minutia of Silicon Valley. Well, when I started writing a book on semiconductors seven years ago, I knew very little about them. I've got no background in electrical engineering or semiconductor physics, but I realized that there were a couple of things that made chips unique, and I wanted to understand how they came to be. One was that I knew that semiconductors improved at a rate more rapidly than basically any other product in human history, doubling in capability every year or two, what's known as Moore's Law. And I want to understand, well, how is that possible to sustain that rate of increase for so long. The second thing I wanted to understand was how it was that China, which I thought of as a manufacturing superpower, spent just as much money importing chips as it spent importing oil. And it seemed to me you couldn't understand the structure of the world economy without making sense of of how that could be. And the third thing that drove me to, to write a book on this topic was trying to understand how it was that such a critical technology was defined by just a couple of companies in just really a handful of countries. And that seemed counterintuitive. We think of competition spurring technological advances, but in the chip industry, there's some competition for sure. There's also <laughs> a lot of concentration and, and all those things seem like interesting puzzles to explore. And that's what first got me interested in chips. So had sort of the core of your work been more involved with geopolitics and other intangible things before you focused on chips? Yeah, that's right. My background is in the intersection of economic history and geopolitics. And that's what my academic work had focused on. And I hadn't previously dug into the history of a physical product like chips. But when I started to do so, I realized both that you couldn't understand how chips emerged without the geopolitical background, but also you couldn't understand either the geopolitical situation today with U.S.-China tensions being the predominant factor or or actually over the past half century without putting the development of computing power at the center. So let's start a little bit with that, about the development of computer power and and the history of chips themselves. There are a lot of companies and names involved here. So for clarity and efficiency's sake, I might try to circumscribe some of the things we talk about. But let's go back to the 1950s, for lack of a better starting period, because some of this could go back to the 19th century. But let's talk about the development of transistors and this little collection of physicists who first started experimenting in the late 1950s with transistors and wound up winning Nobel Prizes. 
But tell us a little bit about the roots of chips in the transistor era. Well, the first transistor was invented in the late 1940s, and it was clear it'd be useful for amplifying signals like radio signals. That's probably why you've heard of a transistor radio. That was one of the initial use cases. And it wasn't really until the mid 50s or late 50s that people realized transistors could be used for computing as well. They could turn circuits on and off and in doing so produce ones and zeros, ones when the circuit was on, zeros when they were off. But individual transistors in the 1950s were pretty flimsy devices that often broke or burned out. And so it wasn't until at the end of the 1950s, Texas Instruments in Texas and then Fairchild Semiconductor in California learned how to put multiple transistors on the same piece of silicon. And that was a, a revolution in quality control because you didn't have to worry about the wires that connected them. They were just built in the same piece of material. And their goal in doing that, Chris, was what? Like, what was their holy grail as they sat around trying to put the world onto a chip? The goal was to make computing more reliable, more inexpensive, and to allow the components to be shrunk down in size. Because before that point, you had to wire every individual transistor together, and so you had a, a jungle of wires. But if you built them all onto the chip, it was much more straightforward, much simpler, and could be mass manufactured. And did they see that as a commercial thing? Did they see that as, you know, computing that big industry and big government would use and that very little of that would wind up in the hand of individuals? You know, the, the initial use case was for missile guidance systems. The Pentagon and NASA were the initial buyers because they, they had big budgets and were willing to spend large sums for low production volumes in the early stage. But just from the first couple of years after the first chips were invented, there were already people like Bob Noyce, who was one of the founders of Fairchild Semiconductor, who realized that if you projected the technology forwards, you could see that costs would come down, that computing power would increase, and that if that happened, there'd be many more uses for this device, including in civilian and consumer applications. So Chris, semiconductor innovation was a particularly U.S. phenomenon in its early days. And into the you know transformative technology boom that chips helped usher in. Why was that? What made the U.S. such a perfect Petri dish for all of this between, say, the late 1950s and the 1990s? I think there were a couple of factors. One was that the U.S. government did put a lot of money behind the chip industry in the early stages. The Pentagon and NASA were big buyers of chips in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. And so that set the industry in motion. But then the companies that defined early Silicon Valley managed to scale up, not by selling to the government, but by selling to a vast consumer market. And the U.S. had the world's biggest consumer market. And not only that, they learned to take the products that worked on the U.S. consumer market and sell them globally. And so the U.S. was probably the best place in the world to scale. And that was absolutely critical to the proliferation of this technology. It's sort of an interesting lesson about how innovation occurs, isn't it? Because when we talk about innovation, are we talking about primarily a private sector phenomenon? Does it involve public sector funding? Are there overlaps? You know, what does it say about how technological innovation occurs? You know, I think I've, over the course of researching the book, I actually came to think that there's two different types of innovation. There's devising a new product, which requires understanding the engineering behind it, for example, but then there's learning to scale it in an efficient way. And in the chip industry, the hardest thing is often learning to scale something, learning to mass manufacture. The initial engineering is tricky, but it's the companies that can scale most efficiently that are often the winners. And that's something that I think when we think of innovation, we often overemphasize the importance of the individual scientists tinkering away in their lab and underemphasize, well, what does it take to actually mass manufacture that? in a way that's cost effective. And that type of innovation has been just as important as the individual inventions. So innovation in the production process itself. That's right, exactly. And of course, like landmark US chip makers came out of this brew, the early leaders like Texas Instruments and Fairchild. But ultimately one of the big 500 pound gorillas in the whole industry was Intel. You know, it eventually lapsed Texas Instruments Intel Inside became a branding coup for them in the personal computer era in the 1990s that really took off in the 80s and 90s. What made Intel such a world beater? And maybe we can also get into a little bit about Gordon Moore and, and Moore's Law since you brought that up at the top of the show. But 
Is there something about Intel's own trajectory as a company that's instructive? I think what made Intel so extraordinary in the early days of Intel was that it reinvented itself a number of different times. It was founded as a firm that would make memory chips. That was the primary type of chip in the 60s and 70s, and it did that for some time. But it also, on the side, began investing in microprocessors, a type of chip that processes data, which was a real niche market in the 70s. But Intel pioneered the first commercial microprocessor and slowly began building up that business. And in the 1980s, when the memory business was in a slump, thanks to a lot more intensified competition, Intel decided to completely jettison its memory business, get out of the industry that it was founded on, and focus entirely on microprocessors. And that was a really wrenching change. One employee said that it was like Ford deciding not to produce cars. It got a huge cultural shift. And it was real risk because at the time the microprocessor market was tiny. But Intel, that effectively, that intelligently, microprocessor demand growing and growing. And the reason it did grow was because Intel managed to get its microprocessor designed into the first PC. And so from the earliest days of the computer industry, there was a a symbiosis between Intel's chips and the Windows operating system. And almost every PC had to be compatible, which meant that either Intel or its competitor AMD, which had similar IP rights, were a duopoly that controlled the market for producing chips for PCs. Let's just define Moore's Law for our listeners, because it was a rule that Intel tried to live by, and it became a shibboleth for Silicon Valley. Gordon Moore was both an engineer and then later a chief executive, I think, of Intel. What was Moore's Law? Well, Moore's Law was really a prediction at first rather than a law. Gordon Moore wrote an article in 1965, so just seven years after the first chip was invented, observing that the number of transistors per chip was doubling every year or two, and therefore the computing capabilities of chips was doubling at the same rate. And he predicted that would continue for at least a decade through 1975. And it turns out that in no small part, thanks to his work running R&D at Intel, Moore's Law continues all the way up to this day. We've had basically a doubling every two years on schedule from 1965 to present. And there's no industry really in all of human history that's kept up that rate of growth for so long. So they had an intense R&D apparatus, and they were well-managed, and they were willing to cannibalize existing businesses to find growth. And they spawned a whole, or helped spawn, a whole cluster of companies in Silicon Valley, from Qualcomm and Broadcom to NVIDIA and AMD. And maybe one of the only biggies that's not based in Silicon Valley is Micron. I think they're in Boise. What links all of those Silicon Valley companies together that were building out all of this chip capacity and innovation and new products that were linked to all of this? Well, the first thing that linked them together was their workforce. One of the things that you find in the in the early days of the industry is that many people would be constantly switching jobs between the different companies you mentioned. And that let them share know-how, share technology, produce a lot of lawsuits between companies and former <laughs> employees in the process. But it ended up being a real catalyst for innovation because it meant that these advances quickly disseminated throughout the industry. And because the technology was advancing so rapidly, in the end, companies didn't worry all that much about their technology leaking because if it leaked in the time it took to leak, your competitors were still a couple of years behind you. And so for companies like Intel, they knew they just had to race ahead as fast as they could. So that was one factor. The other factor was that As the industry got more complex, the supply chain began to split apart. The earliest firms, they did all their work in-house. They designed their software in-house. They purified their chemicals in-house. They built their tools in-house. But as the level of manufacturing sophistication increased, firms that specialized in one part of the production process emerged. And most of those firms emerged in Silicon Valley. And so today, in Silicon Valley, there are a number of precision tool makers that manufacture the equipment that makes chips. And they sell to the entire industry. Every company that wants to manufacture chips has to buy from this small set of companies. And that is all still today largely headquartered in Silicon Valley. So it's a very unique economic ecosystem. In the economic history of the world, these are sort of rare and revolutionary moments when this kind of an ecosystem builds out, correct? It's not entirely frequent. And when it really comes together, it's revolutionary, right? That's right. I think you could look at maybe Detroit and and autos as another example in American history, but there aren't that many of them. 
And if you were a chip firm that wasn't in Silicon Valley, and there have been a couple of successful ones, the barriers to entry were much higher and the pathways to success were much narrower. Another development this time, you've sort of touched on it, is that a lot of the chip firms began outsourcing production. If I'm oversimplifying, correct me, but they kept design in-house, but fabrication facilities or fabs, as the industry calls them, began to be separated for lots of companies from the design process. And being fabless for a period of time was considered a competitive advantage, correct? Yeah, that's right. And in the early days of the industry, you couldn't really do one without the other. You had to know how to design to do the manufacturing and vice versa. But a couple decades ago, new software tools emerged that made chip design essentially a process of computer programming whereas the manufacturing still involved all of the chemicals and the tools and the sophisticated production processes. And the disciplines became so different that there was actually not much that linked them anymore. And so companies realized that if they specialized, they could get very good at whatever they focused on and not have to deal with the rest of the industry. And for companies that's focused on chip design, there's an added benefit, which is that the rest of the manufacturing process was hugely capital intensive, but chip design wasn't. And so you could have very high margins in your products with very little capital costs. And for companies like Qualcomm or Broadcom or NVIDIA, it's been a very attractive business model. Everybody got rich. That's right. <laughs> I want to come back to this because I also think that that phenomenon in some ways ended up haunting the U.S. chip industry. But we'll come to that after we take a quick break and hear from one of our sponsors. We're back with Chris Miller, historian and author of Chip Wars, to talk about why semiconductors, or chips, are now so central to economic, business, and political battles. Chris, we've been talking about U.S. dominance of chip innovation and manufacturing in the post-World War II era, but something happens in 1987 that not many people, other than specialists, were paying attention to. A Taiwanese businessman named Morris Chang founds a company called Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. And this ultimately turns out to be a watershed moment, doesn't it? It absolutely was because it created the first semiconductor foundry, which is a business that doesn't design any chips and only manufactures chips for other customers. And when this idea was set out in 1987 by Morris Chang, who founded TSMC, it was really a radical idea because there were no customers at first. There, there weren't any firms that only designed chips and didn't have any manufacturing facilities. But Morris Chang bet that if he built the manufacturing, new chip design firms would emerge that would need his services. And that's exactly what's happened. And so today, TSMC provides most, or in some cases, all of the manufacturing for many of the world's biggest chip designers, Apple, NVIDIA, AMD, Qualcomm, all of them rely very heavily on TSMC to actually do the manufacturing of all their chips. And like all of the trippy people who have come in and out of this industry, Morris Chang himself has a very interesting personal history and journey. He grew up in China, emigrated to the U.S., was educated at Harvard and MIT. I think he left MIT without getting his Ph.D. And he winds up at Texas Instruments, where he learns a lot about the industry. But then he gets passed over as president of Texas Instruments, which is, again, one of those sort of interesting moments in business history when someone who is both a prophet and an innovator is overlooked by the people around him or her. It's an incredible story of reinvention because Morris Chang had spent his entire career at Texas Instruments. But when he was passed over, he left and moved to the island of Taiwan, which at the time was about as far as the center of the chip <laughs> industry as you could get to set up this new business, TSMC. In fact, he was invited to go back to Taiwan, which he had not lived in before, by Taiwan's political leadership because I guess they were thinking decades ahead at that point, huh? That's right. They saw the trends. Chips were going to get more important, and they wanted a chip industry for themselves. And Morris Chang was their best hope of trying to build one. And so they put up most of the initial capital for his company and were very supportive of TSMC all the way up to the present. And today, TSMC is not only Taiwan's biggest company, it's the biggest publicly traded company by market capitalization in all of Asia. So there's really no company that's more important for Taiwan's economy today. 
TSMC is the company that we referred to in the opening of the show as the most important company you've never heard of. Let's talk a little bit more about TSMC's business model and what made them such a world beater. You know, Morris Chang eventually handed off the reins to Rick Sai in 2005, and the leadership at TSMC really looked at where the industry was going and who they wanted to supply to in a way that the U.S. companies overlooked, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And TSMC, I think, deserves a lot of credit for being willing to take risk on manufacturing when other companies weren't. Repeatedly, Morris Chang and TSMC doubled down on very expensive manufacturing processes, spending billions and billions of dollars in capital expenditure as well as R&D over the past 20 years, betting that if they were able to produce ever more advanced technology, the companies that were the customers would be guaranteed to buy it. And that proved right. And it's why TSMC has more manufacturing capacity than any rivals. It has more advanced capabilities than any rivals. And today, when you look at the foundry market, TSMC produces over half of the volume of the foundry market. And when you look at the advanced segments of chip production, TSMC's market share is over 90%. And they also saw that the mobile phone market was going to be transformative at a time when the U.S. chip industry was still sort of PC-centric. That's right. I think famously, I can't remember, but there was an Intel executive who, who basically said, I don't really get it, what was happening with mobile phones in terms of it being an important new market. Uh, at one point, Steve Jobs came to Intel and said, will you produce the first chip for the iPhone? And Intel did an analysis internally and said, sounds like a low volume, low margin product. I mean, imagine, like, what did that involve in terms of a missed opportunity? Go back to school. <laughs> I want to bring in models and politics a little bit here. Because during the same period when TSMC is planting its stakes in the ground and on its way to becoming a dominant force, interesting things were happening in Japan and China. Japan had been a world leader in miniaturization. Sony was an admired company that created really cool little TV sets. They believed in the idea of mobility. They had embraced transistors as sort of a foundational technology. But they developed a meaningful but not pivotal presence in the chips market. Is there a reason that chip making didn't become bigger in Japan during the same period of time? You know, I think it's really a story of Japanese firms missing key market shifts. Because Japanese firms were good at mass manufacturing certain types of chips, like the memory chips that Intel had produced before it focused on microprocessors. But if you look at the key drivers of chip demand today, PCs, smartphones, now data centers and AI, Japanese firms have not been at the center of any of them. And so there are niches where Japanese firms still have very strong capabilities. But in the core of the chip market, Japanese firms play tangential roles. And that was just a, a series of missed shifts in the business that Japanese firms failed to foresee and to capitalize on. And at the time of you know Japan's sort of economic peak during this period, it was the second biggest economy in the world. Everyone assumed that there was a possibility that Japan would overtake the United States as the world's biggest economy. And then sort of knocking quietly out there on the frontier is China. In 1978, the Chinese government begins economic reforms under Deng Xiaoping that eventually turns China into the world's fastest growing major economy. And in a, over a three-decade period, it eventually leapfrogs Japan faces off with the United States for economic hegemony, and yet is also a relatively insignificant chip maker. Tell us a, a little bit about how you see China appearing in this complex waltz of innovation, technology, and political and economic power that we're seeing take shape during this period. Well, right now, like for the last decade, China is the world's largest importer of semiconductors. And the only reason that China imports ships is because it can't produce most types of cutting edge ships domestically. And this is a challenge that China has been trying to address for some time in 2014. Xi Jinping identified ships as a core technology, as he called it, put tens of billions of dollars a year for the last decade into trying to domesticate chip making technology. But it's been a really difficult struggle for China because it lacks all of the key segments you need to make a chip from the tools to the chemicals to the design software. And for Chinese firms, it's been very difficult to break into the market because this is an extraordinarily complex and concentrated market. And 
at the very time when Chinese firms were trying to break into the market, the industry itself was getting more and more and more concentrated. And indeed, the trend of the last 20 years is more concentration at every segment of the chip supply chain. Are there cultural aspects to this around what makes an innovative country innovative? There's always been this sort of received wisdom that a lot of the Asian economies aren't as innovative as the U.S. They're good imitators, but the nature of both the political and the economic structure in those countries doesn't allow for innovation. And that Japan suffers from that to a certain extent, too. Did that hold China back as the chip wars started to take shape? You know, I think if you look at China's neighbors, you find Korea and Taiwan absolutely central to the production of advanced semiconductors with really advanced capabilities. So I'd be pretty skeptical of a explanation that focused on culture. I think the key factor is that Taiwan and Korea have spent the last four decades trying to integrate themselves into the chip supply chain, and they've each become very successful in one specific node, Korea in making memory chips, Taiwan in making advanced processor chips. But otherwise, they're still hugely reliant on customers, on imported tools, on materials, on software from more advanced economies. And so China's just several decades behind where Taiwan or Korea is today. And the additional challenge that they face is that the geopolitics is making it even more difficult to catch up. So Korea and Taiwan had the insight and the foresight to see how important and pivotal chips would be and bet correctly on that future. And other countries that didn't, at least when it came to semiconductors, were left behind. That's right. And if you think of Korea and Taiwan's positions over the last several decades, the U.S. has been very supportive in the effort to integrate both of these countries into the electronics supply chain to help shore up their economies because they were both important Cold War allies. And so there's both the strategic thinking of those countries' businesses and political leaders, but also the U.S. actively supporting that effort. Okay. Chris, we're going to take another break, hear from a sponsor, and then we will come back to more chip wars and the present gnarly landscape that awaits us all around this. We're back. We're talking with Chris Miller, historian and author about economic and technological warfare. Chris, is it an overstatement to call chips the new oil? You know, I'm reminded of Daniel Juergen's seminal book, The Prize, which was this wonderful weaving of both economic history and political history and how the world became, you know, shaped for the quest to control oil. And I think of chip wars as very much in good company with The Prize. It's also trying and successfully, I think, doing so, an analysis of how integral chips are to our economic futures right now. But am I being too flip by calling chips the new oil? No, I, th I think that's right. And you certainly see basically every major government around the world focusing on chips, either as a strength that it wants to capitalize on or a vulnerability that they want to address because they realize the strategic importance of semiconductors in economic terms and technological terms, but also in military and geopolitical terms. And that's why from Joe Biden to Xi Jinping, every major leader is talking a lot more about chips today than they would have 10 years ago. The headbutting that's occurring now between China and the U.S., it has some of its roots in manufacturing changes, manufacturers moving to China where there was cheaper labor, the offshoring of American industry to China. And now you have this, you know, this real battle for political and technological dominance. Do you think that was inevitable? Do you think this kind of competition between China and the U.S. was inevitable or could it have followed a different path? And we'll loop this back into what's going on with chips. I think the economic competition was inevitable, but the U.S. and Japan had economic competition during the 1980s and 90s, and that didn't result in nearly as tense relations as we have with the U.S. and China today. But the challenge with the U.S. and China today is that on top of the economic competition, there's a military and a geopolitical competition over the South China Sea, over the Taiwan Straits, and over the broader question of who gets to set the rules in East Asia. Because the U.S. drew the map of East Asia after World War II. It's got 
the most important allies in the region, and China wants a different system. And so if you didn't have the geopolitical tensions, the military arms race, then I think the economic issues would be a lot easier to deal with than they have been. But the fact is right now they're deeply intertwined because both countries think that their economic futures will also feed into their ability to compete militarily. The other irony or historical twist in all of this is, of course, China doesn't recognize Taiwan as an independent country. It believes that Taiwan is essentially its island. And the territorial dispute around Taiwan has also shaped the U.S.'s dialogue with China. And in the midst of all that, you have Taiwan shaping up as one of the world's hegemons around chip manufacturing. So irony of ironies, this contested territory also is home to a very productive and world-changing chip-making empire. Is that something that was also never going to work out in a linear way? The fact that this industry developed on China was also going to just add fuel to the fire between China and the U.S.? Well, I think no one in Beijing or in Washington predicted or planned the fact that Taiwan would be the center mm -hmm. of the ship industry today. I think in Taiwan, there are a lot of people who hoped that investing in ships would give them an additional measure of security against China. And that's proven to be a good bet on their part. But it's certainly the case that Taiwan status does intensify the tensions because when the U.S. wants to cut off a U.S. chip design firm from selling to China... Almost all of those advanced chips are actually manufactured in Taiwan. And so the U.S. imposes export controls that the Taiwanese have no choice but to follow. And so we have a situation in which China thinks Taiwan is its territory, but Taiwan is imposing U.S. export controls against China's high-tech sector. And as China's economic heft and might became more apparent in the U.S., you've had different politicians and administrations inveighing against China. Trump as president, made a lot of hay in vain against China, but in a lot of ways that wasn't really followed up with strategic measures that blunted China in any meaningful way. And then you come to Biden and the Biden administration, and in short order, he and Congress passed the CHIPS Act. And let's talk a little bit about the CHIPS Act. It's a $280 billion federal measure that's meant to shore up U.S. semiconductor manufacturers who've fallen behind in the great arms race that is chips making. But it also imposed restrictions on the kind of chips that could go into China. And it is a kind of act of economic warfare, I think. And you may have a different view of it, obviously, but what do you think about the significance of the CHIPS Act? Well, I think if you look at the origins of the CHIPS Act and the export controls, I think what you find is that there's actually been a bipartisan consensus on moving in this direction since really the late Obama administration. And so the changes in the top of the White House haven't actually dramatically changed policy on this direction. And that's because there's a broad sense across both political parties in the U.S. and across the bureaucracy that if China has access to the most advanced computing capabilities, it will deploy these to defense and intelligence uses. And... China's not unique. Every country does that. And insofar as that's true, it will give China new capabilities that it currently doesn't have and erode the technological gap that still exists between the U.S. and Chinese militaries. And so when, when the national security state thinks about chips, it's thinking about the military balance first and foremost. But of course, chips aren't only used in military equipment. Most chips that are sold end up in civilian uses. Something like 98% of chips end up in smartphones or PCs rather than in defense equipment. The problem or the challenge is that the exact same chips that are used, for example, to train a military AI system can be used to train a civilian AI system. And there's no way of differentiating. And so the U.S. is genuine, I think, when it says we're only trying to stop China from using these for military purposes. But in doing so, it's also stopping China from using many of these ships for civilian purposes because there's just no possible differentiation. How has China responded to that? Well, actually, China hasn't responded much thus far. You know, China's already been, over the last decade, pouring tens of billions of dollars a year into its ship industry, and that continues. But that's not a response to U.S. policy. That was actually something that predated U.S. policy by almost a decade. The only real response that China's undertaken is to ban the use of certain chips from one U.S. chipmaker, Micron, 
in Chinese products, which will have a moderately negative effect on Micron, but it's actually a pretty small move relative to the scale of, of what the U.S. is doing to China. If chip supply from Taiwan got cut off, if China invaded Taiwan and made TSMC its very own prize after an invasion, what would be the impact on the global economy and on the U.S.? Well, if there was a war, if an invasion, if missiles were flying, the chip making facilities would shut down and they wouldn't restart. So I think it's highly unlikely that China could invade Taiwan and grab the facilities in a functioning manner. It just wouldn't work that way. So the question is, what would the world look like if all of Taiwan's production went offline? And the answer is that we'd face Great Depression levels of disruption to global manufacturing, because it's not only smartphones and PCs and data centers and telecoms infrastructure that rely on the most advanced ships, of which 90% are produced in Taiwan. So good luck producing a smartphone anywhere in the world. But what we learned during the chip shortage of the past several years is that actually everything relies on chips. A new car will have on average a thousand chips inside. And so ballpark 10 or 20% of those are produced in Taiwan, a typical car. Well, good luck replacing that supply at a time when the entire global production of chips is going to shrink by double digit rates. And so if you not only add up the losses in smartphones and PCs, but also in cars and dishwashers and airplanes and microwaves, you find there's not a lot of goods we can manufacture without access to semiconductors. And Taiwan produces so many semiconductors that the impact would just be catastrophically bad. You know, we have a strategic petroleum reserve that we use to you know, influence oil markets when there's shortages or to have an inventory to get the U.S. past shortfalls in energy supplies. Does that argue for the idea that we should have a strategic chips reserve, inventories alongside this push for greater innovation so we don't get, the U.S. doesn't get put in the position of having a shortfall of chips ever again? You know, I think it's an idea we ought to explore more. It's trickier than petroleum because Every barrel of oil is more or less the same as another. There's different grades, but the differences are pretty minimal. And if you put a barrel in storage for two or four or six years, it still works just as well. Where chips, there's thousands of different types of chips, and they're not interchangeable. You often have to completely redesign a product to put a different chip in it. And because of Moore's law, a chip that was made five years ago is no longer that great. It's often pretty unimpressive for the capabilities that you need. And so a reserve stockpile is much harder to execute well, and the cost would be higher because you get the degradation over time and you have all the different types of products that you need to manage. But in principle, I think you're right that given the risk, we ought to be thinking more hard about are there certain types of chips that we can stockpile while minimizing the costs imposed by these complexities. And do you think U.S. manufacturers, you know, this amazing crop of companies we've talked about that are based in Silicon Valley for the most part, are in a position now to be undisputed world leaders again? Are they structured in the right way? Does the billions of dollars the Biden administration is pouring into the industry, is that going to create a seismic shift in terms of innovation and competition in the chips business? Well, in chip design, the answer is easy because U.S. firms already are the world's leaders, companies like NVIDIA, the world's first trillion dollar chip company. But NVIDIA doesn't manufacture any chips. It just designs them. Most are manufactured in Taiwan. And so the challenge of the Chips Act is can you get more manufacturing of chips in the U.S.? And you know, I think it's going to be hard. It's more expensive to make chips in the U.S. than it is in Taiwan or Korea. We've underinvested in the infrastructure and the workforce you'd need for several decades. And these are all problems that are solvable, but only over a a long time horizon. And so we shouldn't expect the CHIPS Act alone is going to get us independent of our reliance on importing chips from East Asia. That's just a fantasy. We're going to be importing chips from Taiwan, from Korea, from elsewhere in East Asia for many, many years to come. How do you see China ultimately responding to all of this? The Biden administration has upped the ante recently on restrictions of chip sales to China, particularly around applications that involve generative AI. You know, what are China's options and how do you see this playing out there? I think the first option available to China is to make its foreign policy less bellicose to reduce the restrictions that are imposed on it. That's not going to happen, I don't think, under President Xi. Second option is to keep pouring money into the chip industry and hope that more money will help China solve its chip industry problems. 
you know, I think that has some chance of success, though the track record is fine but not great. And I think it'll be a real hard slog if China wants to keep pushing forward in its effort to build a completely self-sufficient cutting-edge supply chain. It's going to be a long way away. And the third option is to give up and recognize that China will have less advanced ships than the rest of the world. And I don't think that's something that President Xi is going to admit for a very long time. But that might be the reality, because the trend in the chip industry is not of catching up. Most people think, oh, that technology is going to naturally disseminate, people will catch up. But the rate of progress in the chip industry is so rapid that actually the trend is of falling behind. The U.S. fell behind Taiwan. Japan fell behind Taiwan. Europe fell behind Taiwan. Korea is struggling to keep up to Taiwan. And so why should we assume that China, which is several generations behind Taiwan in terms of chip making capabilities and can't access the chip making tools and can't access the chip making software, why should we assume catch up is the base case. It seems we should assume China's a normal country, and normal countries have tended to fall behind. Which means then that China's going to have to rethink its posture towards the rest of the world if it needs that supply of chips to keep coming into the country in a way that promotes growth. They can't really get there by always carrying around a big stick, right? That's the dilemma that imposes on China over the longer run. You know, it's not a problem for this year or next year, but it is a problem for the late 2020s if Chinese firms have access to much less capable chips and therefore face limitations, inefficiencies, higher costs when they try to train and develop AI systems. You said at the top of the show, Chris, that you really didn't know anything about chips seven or so years ago when you first decided to make it a focus of your life. So what have you learned over that long journey you've had in digging into chips and the chip wars? What do you know now that you didn't know seven years ago? I think the thing that really struck me is the appreciation I've developed for advanced manufacturing. I thought of computing as something that happened in digits behind my screen, and I didn't really realize the extent to which there's an extraordinary set of companies capable of moving materials at basically the atomic level whose capabilities are necessary to produce all the computing that you and I rely on. We take these companies for granted, and we shouldn't because the capabilities are really extraordinary, and the countries in which they're located are key to shaping not just the future of computing, but the balance of power on the world stage. Chris, we've run out of time. Thank you for being such a great teacher and author and guest, all rolled into one. Well, thanks so much for having me. Chris Miller is the author of Chip Wars, and is also a historian at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. He can be found on Twitter, at CRMiller1. Here at Crash Course, we believe that collisions can be messy, impressive, challenging, surprising, and always instructive. In today's Crash Course, I learned that manufacturing really matters. It doesn't matter how fancy or complex the industry you're in. If you don't know how to make things and how to make them well and make them competitively, you're in for some trouble. Just ask U.S. semiconductor manufacturers, just ask China, and just talk to Taiwan when you have a moment. What did you learn? We'd love to hear from you. You can tweet at the Bloomberg Opinion handle, at Opinion, or me, at Tim O'Brien, using the hashtag Bloomberg Crash Course. You can also subscribe to our show wherever you're listening right now and leave us a review. It helps more people find the show. This episode was produced by the indispensable Anna Mazarakis, Moses Andam, and me. Our supervising producer is Magnus Henriksen, and we had editing help from Sage Bauman, Katie Boyce, Jeff Grocott, Mike Nietzsche, and Christine Vanden Bylart. Blake Maples does our sound engineering, and our original theme song was composed by Luis Guerra. I'm Tim O'Brien. We'll be back next week with another Crash Course.